welcome back. Welcome to part two of sourdough bread making. Our little helper Zavi uh, is playing basketball outside so we can refocus or I can refocus again. Um, but we were talking about all the different flours that you can use to make the sourdough bread and the kind of results that you're gonna yield. And in that time, our dough was able to relax enough so that we can do our second set of stretch and folds. At this stage, I like to change my dough into a boil bowl that has a little bit of oil in it just so I don't get some of the dry bits from when I was mixing the dough in with the dough. So I'm gonna go get a little bit of oil to oil this. I don't really care what oil you use, just a tiny, tiny amount. It also helps to get your hands a little bit slippery for when you're gonna move the dough into it. All right, so I'm moving my dough in. Here we are. And I'm going to give it its second set of stretch and folds. We have to do four sets in all with about a 20 minute break in between. Stretch and fold. Stretch and fold. Do you see how our dough has loosened up and it looks a lot smoother? Sometimes you just need to give it a little bit of time to hydrate. Stretch and fold. And it's starting to resist me, like I'm trying to pick it up and it's not really letting me do that. And that's when I know that I'm ready to let it rest again before I give it another set of stretch and folds. Go. Here we are. Okay, I think I'm ready to let it rest again. Those of you that are using weaker flours like all purpose or spelt, this might take you twice as long. Don't worry about it. What I want is for you to be able to stretch and fold it, and as soon as you're trying to stretch it and it's having a harder time, then you can stop. You can totally do this in a KitchenAid mixer. It's not great, especially for your really delicate doughs, but it does work if you have carpal tunnel or you have like a shoulder injury or something. Okay, so we're gonna let this rest for another 20 minutes. And, uh, and then we'll do another set of stretch and folds. So just for the purposes of moving along, I would love to just show you how to shape dough. But let's go over all the steps first. I'm gonna wash my hands. And go back over all the steps. So the first thing that we did was we took active sourdough starter. That meant that we took sourdough starter that floated um, in a cup of water that smelled sweet and tangy and we mixed it with a little bit of water and flour. And that mixture sat for six to eight hours until it was ready to power both of our loaves of bread. It's really important that your sourdough starter is active. That means it's not coming straight out of the fridge because that means it's very sleepy and it's been hibernating. And it means that it's not smelling very sour or vinegary. If it smells really vinegary, it's hungry and it's not gonna be strong enough to power your bread anymore because it's kind of at the tail end of its life cycle. So when it smells really vinegary or it's not floating, feed it, let it sit for six hours to eight hours and then use it to make your levain. So the first step was to make the levain. You take your active sourdough starter, some water and some flour, mix it up, wait six to eight hours. Step two, auto lease. We took the bulk of the water and flour that makes up our bread dough and we let it rest for about 30 minutes to an hour. And we did that towards the end of this levain cycle. Then we mixed our dough by taking the levain, the auto leased water and flour, and some salt, and we mixed them together. I like cut them with my hands like this made it look really even, and did a first set of stretch and folds. That's the way that we need this slightly wetter dough um, in order to organize the gluten proteins and create that webbing that we're going to need in order for it to expand and capture the gas that the yeast is giving off, all right? So we have to do four of those sets of stretch and folds with about 20 minute break in between, and we've just done our second one. In a moment, we'll do our third because we're just going to pretend like 20 minutes is going by. Um, and then we have to let our bread bulk rise. That means rise in a blob. This can happen for three hours at room temperature or for eight to 12 hours in the fridge. So you get to choose your own adventure there. Let it sit out for three hours at room temperature or put it in the fridge for eight to 12 hours. The longer the fermentation, the more flavor you're going to develop. That's why long fermented breads have more flavor, more complexity than breads that grow really quickly. So consider using the fridge to slow things down and maybe to give you the opportunity to take a break, you know, like do this at night, pop it in the fridge in the morning, you'll be ready to shape your bread. It is easier to shape cold dough than it is to shape a wet dough. 
So if you're looking for an extra boost of help, consider that. So I'm gonna do our third stretch and fold on our bread dough really fast. Hello, bread dough. Here we go. If you're worried about your hands getting very sticky, just get them a little bit wet. Put some water on them. Here we are. Stretch and fold. Stretch and fold. Sort of like an exercise. And stretch and fold. So we're building tension here because the gluten proteins are like, wait a minute. Oh, we're moving around so much and we're tightening up and we're getting all like this together, but you're like, okay, that's fine. I'll tense you up a little bit, get you organized, and then you get to relax before I do it again. All right, here we go. It's getting stiffer and stiffer. Look at the difference between this dough and what we first mixed together. Okay, there we go. That is our third stretch and fold. And what I'd like to do is pretend like we did our fourth one, and then right now just show you how to shape your bread. So again, between the last stretch and fold and the time you shape it, you have to let your dough bulk rise. You're gonna do it at room temperature for three hours or in the fridge for eight to 12 hours. It's very simple. If you're confused at all about the process, email us at hotline at thegourmandyschool.com. So I'm gonna grab some bread dough that miraculously is ready to shape and I'm gonna show you how to shape one into a loaf and one into a boule or a ball. Let me wash my hands again really quickly. And get this ball rolling. Get it? <laughs> okay, so here is my dough. It went through four stretch and folds and then it rested at room temperature for three hours. It's jiggly and a little bit bubbly um, and it's mostly whole grain flour so it's not going to look as big and puffy as if I used white flour. A lot of you who made your milk bread sent in pictures of your doughs that you had made with bread flour and you were really concerned that it wasn't looking as big and puffy as the ones I had made with mostly bread flour. Um, so whenever you're working with whole wheat flour, it's not going to look in, as big and as puffy as the white flour ones, but you're gonna have better flavor. So something to keep in mind. So I'm gonna dump this out right here. I don't really need very much flour here. You'll notice that we use very little flour when we're shaping our breads. Okay, I'm gonna grab a little bit though. And let's talk about first the loaf one. So. With the first one, I'm gonna make a very simple pan loaf. So I'm gonna drop some parchment paper in here in my loaf pan. I put a little tiny bit of oil on the sides. You don't absolutely have to. It just helps to get it out a little bit later, a little more easily. I'm gonna cut this in half. There we go. I love the bench scraper. It's really my favorite tool in the kitchen. And I'm gonna add a little bit of flour on my table before I start shaping, but a very little amount. You can use all-purpose flour for this or bread flour. I really like using white rice flour. It doesn't get absorbed into the dough quite as much, and it gives you a nice little layer. Okay, so I'm gonna pick up my dough here, and you'll notice that the dough is really slack. It's just kind of like this. And what we do when we're shaping our bread is we build tension so that all the gas that's trying to escape from the yeast grows in one direction and tries to exit in one direction. If we keep our dough really slack, it's just gonna keep growing like this instead of upwards. So there's a lot of different techniques that we use in order to control that growth and the lift of the growth. The other thing that we do is when we bake the bread, we bake it with a lot of tension by shaping it, but in a really hot vessel so that a lot of pressure can form and all of that steam from the water that's trapped in your dough tries to escape the bread again in one direction. It kind of all goes out in one place. To do that, we have to build tension in our dough and we do that through the shaping process. Every baker has a different way of shaping bread. I shape one way, other people shape other ways. So I'm gonna show you the way I like to shape it. And it's not that different when I'm doing a loaf bread as when I'm doing a boule or a round one. I'm gonna stretch my dough out. See, I'm not pinching. I'm using my hands like flat open paddles. And I'm just gonna stretch my dough so I have a lot of real estate in this direction to work with. I'm gonna stretch my dough out like this and fold it over. So now I've got like a little pouch here. And I'm gonna build tension by doing a series of stitches from side to side and side to side. So I'm gonna take one side here and stretch it as much as I can, sort of like when you were doing your stretch and folds, and flap it all the way over here. And I'm gonna stretch this one and fold it all the way over. 
See how we're building tension already? It went from being a slack blob to all of a sudden feeling a little taut. Stretch and fold and stretch and fold. There we go. And now I'm down at the bottom. I'm gonna take this little end piece here and fold it over. Ooh, look at that little air bubble there. That's a really good thing. That's carbon dioxide trying to get out of your bread dough, but the yeast was eating and giving off carbon dioxide and the gluten proteins that we stretched and folded into that webbing captured it. Don't try to pop those. That's what gives you bubbles in your inside of your bread. Now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna turn it 180 degrees. So just turning it so now it's facing me and I'm gonna give it another set of little stretches and folds. Um, do not flour the dough. The dough doesn't have a problem. You're the one with the problem, so flour your hands rather than flouring the dough because if my dough is really dry, all these little stitches won't stick to one another and I won't be able to build as much tension. It's so bouncy. Okay, now we've done two sets of stitches and I'm just gonna very gently roll this up without squeezing it onto itself like that and then kind of guide it towards me. I like to give it a couple little zhuzh and shoves like this to make sure that there's one seam underneath. And because I'm putting this in a loaf pan here, I'm gonna just rock it from side to side very gently. I'm gonna pick this up and place it seam side down here into my loaf pan. So I'm gonna pick this up and gently lower it in the loaf pan like so. And it's going to proof in here and we'll bake it in here. Got it? So three hours from now at room temperature, it'll be ready to bake. But if I can put it in the refrigerator, I'll do that for eight to 12 hours, and then I'll warm up the oven and take it straight from the fridge to the oven. All right, so let me set this aside and show you how to shape the boule. Okay, here we are. All right, so we're gonna make a classic sourdough boule, something that's gonna end up looking like this. So it's round um, and it's gotta have a lot of tension so that when we slash our bread right before baking, there's only one exit point for everything to pop out. So there we go. Maybe I need a tiny, tiny bit of flour on my surface, just a tiny, tiny bit. All right. And the most important thing here is not to deflate this. That's why I'm trying not to squeeze it and I'm keeping my hands as flat open paddles. I'm gonna do the same motion. Don't be afraid of sticky dough. Do you notice how little I'm actually touching the dough with my hands? I'm just kind of barely touching it and just letting it stretch over, making my motions as big as I can. Okay, before I do anything else, I wanna prepare my proofing basket. So this round bread will not bake in this thing. It'll just train upwards in here. I wanna bake a loaf of bread that's round, that's tall, and that has one exit point. So I'm gonna pick the deepest, narrowest bowl I have in my kitchen or use a cane basket like this called a banneton, B-A-N-N-E-O-T-O-N. Um, but if you don't have one of these, grab the deepest, narrowest bowl in your kitchen, put a thick linen towel in it, and line the towel very generously with some flour. If you have rice flour, great. If you have all-purpose flour, bread flour, that works too. If you wanna put down some oats on there, you can do that, but I'm gonna show you how to top this with sesame seeds in just a moment. Um, so yeah, I don't want you to overthink it, but I do want you to think about the size and the shape of the basket you should use the deepest, narrowest bowl because you want your bread to proof upwards, not outwards. So if you train your bread to grow in a really wide bowl, it's gonna lose all that tension, okay? So these are fantastic, but you can make great bread by just using a deep and narrow bowl and a linen towel. On that note, I'm gonna get a little towel wet here so I can show you how to add sesame seeds to the top of your bread. go and I'm gonna grab some sesame seeds here so you can see this okay so we did the double stitching here on our bread and now I'm gonna be ready to roll that up again I think you might want to see this whole action again so why don't we just pretend like this bread dough hasn't been shaped yet because I want to show you this process one more time I'm gonna pick up my dough like this and kind of stretch it into a rectangle 
There we go. And, and I'm gonna pick it up and flap it over. I'm gonna take the sides here and stretch them and stitch them. So I'm picking up the right side and folding it over and the left and folding it over. Do you notice how mine is tearing? It's because our dough is getting a little tighter. Like as soon as we begin to move the dough, the gluten proteins tighten up again. So if this is happening to you in the shaping process, let your dough rest for five minutes and come back to it and you'll notice it'll be a lot more lenient with you. Turn it, stretch as much as you can without tearing and stitch it. So one side at a time. Once you've done this a few times, it's hard to slow down and do that. Oh, do you see how lovely and taut it is? And I'm gonna pick it up and roll it really gently without deflating it. And I like to do this a few times just to rock it and make sure that the seams are well organized at the bottom. Okay, now I wanna add sesame seeds, but now I have a little bit of flour on here, they're not gonna stick to that. So I'm going to pick up my dough so that the seam is on my palm like so, and I'm gonna wet the dough a little bit, and then pop it here. I have some sesame seeds, sorry, you can't see them. There we go. And now, I'm going to line my bonneton here with some flour, pick up my dough, and place it seam side up. Okay, I'm going to take this, because it's loosened up a bit, and I'm gonna organize those stitches a little bit more, just so my dough stays nice and taut. Sometimes it opens up again, especially if you've picked it up to add stuff to it. But don't worry, you want it to be that nice little pupusa here. Okay, so next step is to put parchment paper over it. I really like this trick because it helps me to get the bread into the hot Dutch oven before baking or when I'm ready to bake. So I'm going to add a bunch of flour on here because I'm gonna put parchment paper on, but I don't want the parchment paper to get baked onto the bread. So. Put a little flour on top and grab yourself a piece of parchment paper. Here we are. Place it over like so. Press it ever so slightly. And just like the other one, you can let this rise at room temperature for three hours or you can let it um, rise overnight in the fridge. So eight to 12 hours. You can do 12 to 18 if you're gonna put it in the back of the fridge where it's colder. So in a few hours, I'm gonna tape this some more. So I'm gonna wait um, until these rise and then I will come back for part three of sourdough bread making, which is how to bake your sourdough bread. Thanks so much, have a great day, and check in with me in a few hours when we upload this third part of the video. Bye.